in order for America to do well, we have to help these refugees assimilate. Whether you help them or ignore them, they are there. And they, these children are the future of America. Welcome to Hello World, where we help you to rediscover the good that's all around you. In today's podcast, we welcome a dynamic duel who are perfect partners in life. They're fun loving and energetic and they pour out their love to the people around them. And through their non-for-profit organization, H4OPE, they s provide support to the refugees who have recently resettled in our community. And we hope through this episode, you'll learn a little bit more about the refugees and how you might be able to lend a hand. So without further delay, let's welcome the Johnsons. Welcome to our in-studio podcast, your guest number one sitting in our new studio. Yay, Yay. Thank welcome. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. Thank you Thanks for having, for having us. us. So yeah, before we jump right into all this work that you guys do, why don't you share a little bit with our audience um, a little bit about yourself? Because I know you have a lot, because I said you are fun loving and energetic. So uh, share a little bit about yourself. We both enjoy hiking and mm -hmm. rock climbing. Mm -hmm. So there's no rock climbing in Houston. So we do indoor rock climbing. Yes, you do. Twice a week. We work out together Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Mm -hmm. And we climb every Tuesday, Saturday. And most of our vacations are scheduled around hiking. Yes. Different parts of the country and other countries. And whenever I see your vacation pictures, if I feel like the whole world is just the two of you uh, in, in some mountains and some um, peaks of... That, uh, <laughs> that is how we pick a lot of our hiking locations. Yes. Ah. Is off the beaten path, away from the crowds. Mm. To get yeah. away. Li living in Houston, we're around crowds all the time. So. Yes, indeed. we like getting away. Yes, yes. So um, before you, I think right now you're full-time working in your ministry. Yes. Before you got into this, you had another professional life. Yes. What did you do? So I am a CPA, mm -hmm. and I uh, have been an executive for almost 20 years mm -hmm. but now that our kids have graduated one is married and another one's getting married um, it's allowed me to be able to cut some costs and <laughs> I can now do ministry full-time which is such a huge blessing because it's really it's really what I'm called to do right now in my life and yes. so um, we've been able to make that work. Mm -hmm. So I am doing ministry full time. Mm -hmm. And David, you are? Uh, I'm, you I'm I feel like you're doing ministry full time, but mm -hmm. some days it feels like it, mm -hmm. uh, but I still have a full time job. I'm an IT manager. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been in that, I've been in that job for 20 years. I've been in IT for mm -hmm. almost 30. Wow. And, and now you are um, still doing that, but Spend a lot um, of time. All my non-working time is with doing it. this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So your non-for-profit organization, everybody wants to say hope, for hope. Yes. But it's H4OPE. Can mm -hmm. you share with us what, or, or audience, what does it stand for? And how did you get started with that? So I wanted to use the word hope. But for you to be able to find a uh, name of an organization in the state of Texas that have not been used. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to get that an unused name to match with a domain name. Mm. It's very hard. Yes. So I thought if I added a number in there, it does help it, which it did. Mm -hmm. So um, it does say it is hope, but it's kind of a play on words, so that's why the four sits inside the H. Mm -hmm. So it's hope for the oppressed, the poor, and the encumbered. Okay. And How did it get started? Um, so actually, I was helping the refugee community through my church. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I am a refugee myself. And I guess after so many years of just living life here, I never even thought that we even have refugees. Mm -hmm. So whenever our church was doing some outreach for the for the refugee community, I was so shocked to find out that there still are refugees here. And when we went over there, the whole apartment complex is 100% refugees. And they were so scared. They mm -hmm. didn't want to come out. They didn't want to say hi. And I didn't really understand. So when our first, how I got into the community and got them out of their apartment complex was to do a major clothes distribution. I just collected all the clothes and I just dumped all the clothes out in the parking lot and they all started coming out to take clothes. And as they were coming out, I started writing down their names and their apartment number mm -hmm. so that when we come back, they'll remember who we are. I see. So, so we you only, meet their most immediate needs Yes. And they, through clothing. Just providing clothing for them. And they were so excited because it was like free shopping for them. So, um, and so that, that was one way how we can introduce ourselves to the community mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because when we went the time before that, um, and we walked around, no one even said hello to us. They didn't even make eye contact. They don't know who you are. And then as I, um, so I'll tell you the story. So after that, we um, got their names and their, mm -hmm. and this was around uh, Halloween. Mm -hmm. So I also passed out candy for the kids. Um, so then for Thanksgiving, I thought it would be neat to get some Luby's uh, Thanksgiving meals yes and to hand them out to each family and then we got to know each family as we delivered these traditional Thanksgiving meals American to them. American style yes. Thanksgiving. It helps them to understand yes. the new culture that they live yes. in. Yes. And their kids probably go to school and yes. they are probably making pilgrim hats yes. and have no idea what and it's for. And learning all about Thanksgiving but mm -hmm. not eating the actual meal other than oh, what's at school. So then as we got into these apartments, I then found out that almost all of, th this was the Burmese community at that time, mm -hmm. that almost all of the Burmese children um, are born in the refugee camp. Mm. And the parents, their parents were either born in a refugee camp or have been in a refugee camp since the age of three or four. So the parents, have no idea what it's like to even live outside of a refugee camp. So not even in their co home country's yes. culture, the culture that they know is refugee yes. camps. Yes, they don't even know what life is like not in a refugee camp. I can only yes. imagine um, the, the shock and appalled of being in America that is so different, so different from... Well, they, I, they actually, I mean, living in an, an apartment here versus a refugee camp is luxury from what they're getting. Because mm -hmm. in a refugee camp, um, I was in a refugee camp um, in Malaysia. And as a kid, I don't remember anything other than swimming in the beach. and but So I don't remember the hardship. But their refugee camp in mm -hmm. Thailand, because they're from Burma, and they had to escape the persecution there, so they went to Thailand. The refugee camp in Thailand is not the refugee camp that I experienced in Malaysia. It's a very difficult life. Yes. You have very minimal. You don't have beds. You're sleeping on cots mm -hmm. or on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times, whatever belongings you have, it's mm -hmm. very limited. So you can't just... S and the camps are so big, you can't just send your children to go to the restroom by themselves because they actually can get, can get killed lost. or oh. you know, killed or raped or oh. any of these things. So someone has to go with them. Mm -hmm. So in a small family, a lot of times if the dad is busy doing something, the mom has to scoop up all the children if they're young and all their belongings and walk them to the restroom and back because if you leave your belongings unattended, it could get stolen. Now they because have a bathroom in their own apartment. There's yes. no doors to lock. 
Yes. In these refugee camps. It's like a giant tent, basically, and you just we, have cots and your belongings are there. We've seen pictures of those camps that the, the refugees would show us, mm. and they're basically bamboo huts with no doors. Yes. Um, so th wow. there's, no, there's no private space like you'd have. Even in the, the apartments that they're in here, mm -hmm. they have a door they can lock. That's just... In bedroom, like multiple doors. Yes. Mm -hmm. in yes. A, in a, dwelling place. So you also work with the Afghan community. Yes. So tell us a little bit about them because I think they're they're also culturally very different. They're very different. So um, there's been a mass influx of Afghans into our community because of the Taliban mm -hmm. since uh, August of 2021. Mm -hmm. um, it first started with the United States going over there and just doing a mass rescue mm -hmm. and brought them over here. And recently I found out that there are 26 apartment complex in Houston alone that houses all these Afghans. The, the Afghans for our community is the number one um, refugee um, people group, is it, in our community? Oh. As far as we're aware. Yeah. So I'm not aware of any larger refugee community. Refugee or Afghan community? Refugee. Refugees. Oh. The, the, most of the refugees now that have been entering recently or yes. resettling are Yes, Afghans. are Afghans. Yes, yes. that is correct. Mm -hmm. Just because of that. Mm -hmm. But um, the mass influx actually came in in 2021. The ones that are, we still have some coming in um, today. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that work for the United States Army that weren't able to escape. But the United States have been taking them um, a few at a time. So they are still coming in. Because their life is in danger yes. for working with the yes. United States. Yes, and then um, it's also the opportunity of when the United States can bring them also. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when they, the recent ones, like in the last year, the ones that are coming in, mm -hmm. they get a phone call and they, they're told that they have to get on the plane. And... They have to leave whatever they're doing. They're in the middle of their job. They might be wearing their army's outfit or whatever they're doing. They can't. They don't even have time to pack a bag. They literally have to go immediately. And then so that's when we met this one family who the mom had just had a baby. Mm. And they had to go. So she left her and her brand newborn baby didn't have uh, a passport. So she left the baby with her mom and then the Taliban didn't allow women to leave the house any longer so at first when they first took over it's my understanding what I've been told by the Afghans is they the women can um, go to the grocery store but they'd have to like go right back home they can't hang out outside mm -hmm. and girls uh, fourth grade and younger were allowed to go to school but that's it Mm -hmm. And then in the last year, no women are allowed to leave their homes under any circumstances. So the grandma could not get milk for that baby that they left behind. So he died three months later of starvation. That must be rough. I mean, to have to leave their country yes. with their literally shirts on their back. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then leaving behind not just their belongings, but their loved ones. Yes. It's That's, really sad. It's really sad. Yeah. <sighs> but so now that they're here, what are their biggest challenges that you see? Um, one, I think for me, that's hardest for me to see is they don't, they, they don't normally, t it, it appears that they don't normally value education. Mm hmm especially for girls. A lot of the girls don't even go to school over there when they before the time of the Taliban. So they are very laid back about getting the kids registered for school. Mm -hmm. So I've been having to really push the yes. parents to res register the mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. um, especially the girls. They're very prompt in registering the boys, but the mm -hmm. girls, they're just like, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then the girl, a lot of the girls, because when they were over in Afghanistan, they didn't go to school. So I had a twin, a set of twins where the brother is in fourth grade, but the sister is in second grade. Mm. 
because she didn't go to school in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So when she had to start in kindergarten, and when the brother came over here, he has been going to school, so he was able to start in second grade. So there's a great difference, even though they're twins. Wow. I mean, I think they already know that they have differential treatment, but now here, um, because they will go to school, the girls who did not go to school and they're older than all of their their yes. classmates, it, it will have some kind of impact on them yes. because, you know, no matter, I guess, what what ethnicity you are, you do have that teenage years coming up and, yes, and you're, feeling different. Yes. And it's going to be difficult during when they get there. Mm -hmm. Right now, you know, in, in elementary, it, it's not things they think about, right? Mm -hmm. They're just making it day to day, just trying to get their grades and living life. And it's I, I think that it'll have more of an impact on them when they're a little older. But Yeah, yes. And so some of the, um, the ones that I've, was had the privilege of sh uh, working with you guys in the in the apartment. Um, they are older when they came, and because they didn't go to school back home, mm -hmm. they're in much lower grade. Yes, and and they're already in their teen years. So yes, it's very, and they're not able to read. Yes, tough. and it's not just able to read in English; they can't even read in their own language. It's very challenging to teach them English when yes. you can't even translate for them because yes. they don't read right. their own language. Right. Wow. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's hard. So so now they come with just a few things on their back and maybe whatever they can carry. Um, what are the greatest needs in, that they have to that you guys are able to support or, or at least point them in the right direction? So when they first come here, um, they are provided <clears throat> an apartment to stay in with six months of free rent. Mm -hmm. And they do have food stamp for food. But that even that in itself takes a while to kick in. So sometimes some communities will come in there and help them. Some of their uh, refugee representations, uh, representatives uh, from various um, organizations will come in and help them. However, we did find a family where they didn't know how to turn on electricity. They had a handicapped child. We walked into their apartment and it's starting to hit summer with no electricity, no food, they literally are in an, a complete empty apartment wow. with this handicapped child. Wow. And so we immediately brought some rugs, some food, helped them get mm. the electricity turned on. So the next, I think two days later, they did finally get electricity. But, um, you know, I, I think hardship for them right now is not unexpected for them. So I guess it's not as hard, but... For us, when we see that, it's it's really difficult. So they're basically coming over here with nothing. Um, mm -hmm. And they probably didn't have too much to begin with. Yes. So I guess that's an interesting point that maybe their, their differential versus what we see yes. is, is not the same as ours, um, which I think it's in the, at least in the right direction because we will feel more compassionate, yes. right? Because if they're better off than we are, then... Our, our compassion meter is probably not registering. So. Well, mm -hmm. I think one of the big differences between the Burmese mm -hmm. um, and the Afghan, the, the Burmese all came over here having lived for 10, 20 years in refugee camps. Mm -hmm. They literally knew nothing. Nothing. They didn't know anything about having their own mm -hmm. furniture or home to mm -hmm. live in and, and all the things that go with that. But all the Afghans that come over, they came from that. They had homes where they were with furniture and established lives and family around them. So yes. they had an entire community that they were coming from. Mm -hmm. um, so their their mentality is completely different. Yes. And, you know, so they know what they're missing. Mm -hmm. The Burmese had no idea what they're missing. Mm -hmm. They're starting from literally zero. They have no concept, but the Afghans do. So they... They're already, when they get here, they already know what they're striving to get. They want to get furniture and, you They know, don't know what to ask for. They, yes. Yes, yes, they do. And then with the, with the other so. community, you have to say, here, you need this. Yes, they don't know what they don't know, right? Oh, interesting. So even with the Burmese, um, the first time they've ever, ever, those kids have been in a house was at in our house. We took them to our house and some of our friends' house. 
they it, it blew their minds because they've never been in a house. They're like, this is the first time I've ever seen a house. What's a house, right? Yes. Yeah, it's not a tent, and you're, you have so many doors. I think yes. At, at least one of them went in our house and said, is this a furniture store? Yeah. <laughs> they asked if our house was a furniture yeah. store. It's funny. Because you have a breakfast area table and a dining table. It's like, why do you need so many? Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. So, so tell us about the the H four OPE program. It's besides grabbing them, for, you know, furnitures and, and donations. You guys are there at least once, if not twice, or three times. Sometimes a week. every day. So, yes. Yeah. So tell us what what you guys do with through your organization. So our uh, goal is to assimilate the refugees into our community. Um, when we I first started, so the the Afghans and the Burmese are so different, as David explained. So with the Burmese, um, what I saw was the recycling of the use of welfare. Mm -hmm. So the family lives on welfare. They don't even know what life is like without welfare, right? Because they've only lived in refugee camps, which everything is provided to, to you, but in smaller amounts than it is here. So then what I saw was the older children would finish high school, they would get the same uh, assembly line jobs as their parents, and then they would just move next door mm -hmm. in, the, in the same apartment complex. And so the... Poverty just recycles from generation to generation at this point. Yeah, so, there was no getting out of yes, that. But they don't even know what that looks like. There, there's no aspiration because they didn't... They don't they know what no they know how to. They yeah. have no concept. They don't even know what that looks like to even aspire to it, mm. right? It, they just know this refugee camp, and then this is how my parents currently live. So that's how I live, right? That's all they know. Is that why you take them to these to yes. your house to see that? Yes. Hey, mm -hmm. outside of these apartment complex, it's a whole new uh, world out there yes. and that you mm -hmm. actually need to participate in. Because mm -hmm. the family that one of the families that we work with, they were they arrived seven years ago and they are still living in the exact same unit seven mm -hmm. years later, and they haven't progressed at all. So. I realize that it's very difficult to change the parents, mm. their mindset. Yes. This is, mm -hmm. they're raised this way. They don't understand it. It's too uncomfortable for them to change. Mm -hmm. So that's why I decided. Well, they're focused on providing for their family. Yes, right now. And Basically, it's too much yes. for them to, to, they don't have the capacity to move beyond just providing those basic yes. needs. The and those needs that comes every day, like yes. you got to eat every day. Every day, so yes. it does. Right. It, it's very difficult for them, mm -hmm. and then it's difficult to also change older people, as you know. They tend to be. Yes. I know. Yes. <laughs> yes, but I do too. And so, um, and then it's harder for them to learn English mm -hmm. to now try to get a career or mm -hmm. do something different. Sure. So that's why I decided I'm going to start with the children because they are our future generation, yes. also, and they're going to be the ones to get their parents and them and then their children out of poverty. We visited colleges, we take them to the movie theater. Mm -hmm. Last summer we took 50 refugee children to a movie theater on a bus and of the 50, only four kids had ever been in a movie theater before that. Wow. We, are, we take so many things for granted For granted. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they got to see a movie. Yes. In a theater with air conditioning and cushy seats. Yes. And I'm sure you bought them. Um, oh, yes. The person that sponsored it made sure that I provided popcorn, candy, pizza. They they the were so experience. they were they got the full experience. So I, we have the most gracious donors I, I could ever ask for. What what did they I mean, tell me about their their uh expressions or what this what is it? the best day ever <laughs> it was a lot so of cute gosh yeah. just you know simple things that we you yes. know okay what's what's in the movie theater yeah. we just go but for them some, it's a, some more things that absolutely blew their mind when uh -huh. we've taken them out you take them to uh, an office building or a mall and you put them on an elevator mm -hmm. they have no idea what that is the buttons no, the, the feeling of going up and down oh, the elevator. The, 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 the gravity. They've never been yes. on a, an escalator. <clears throat> yes. 
they were scared to get on it yes. and scared to get off. Yes. Just, yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's all those things that we take for granted. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it was so cute. The other one. So they experienced the elevator. And so it was going down. They're like, we're falling. I'm like, you're fine. You're okay. <laughs> so um, a year later, I was like, okay, I'm going to take you to an amusement park so you can ride a roller coaster. And this boy, he was like, he's an older boy too. He's like, no problem. I know what that's like. I've ridden an elevator. <laughs> That's so cute. I'm like, no, the roller coaster is nothing like an ele elevator. No, 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 I got this. I'm not going to be scared. I've ridden an elevator. I know what it's going to be like. He was so scared on that roller coaster, he wouldn't come back on it. You <laughs> know, I don't even twice. ride roller coasters, so I can only imagine. But what a neat experience for them to to expect, yeah. right? To see different things, to start expecting yes. um, things better for themselves and yes. for their family. They need to see life outside. So um, the same donor that gave mm -hmm. us, that sponsored the movie theater, mm -hmm. he also owns a Korean barbecue place downtown. So mm -hmm. he allowed us to take the families and all the uh, down there to experience, to eat Korean barbecue. Well, they were so poor that most of their meals is a lot of rice and a lot of rice noodles. Mm -hmm. And then they make broth with fish, and that's their flavoring, and then they just put, like, raw vegetables in there. They just eat a lot of carbs to fill up. So they rarely have ever, they rarely ever eat meat. Um, I've eaten with them plenty, and I've had meat one time. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the most the kids have ever seen meat. Did they have upset stomach afterwards? <laughs> No, they, they went did. to throw up. Oh, that's where this is It wasn't is going. just an upset stomach. They oh. literally went to the bathroom and started throwing up because the the meat was so delicious. And it they is. Just, and they ate a whole bunch. Way they over ate eight. three bowls of rice. You know, those Korean yes. rice is very, three bowls of that rice. And then they ate, because it was an all-you-can-eat place, <laughs> we just kept ordering. They ate everything. I was just... <laughs> Like, besides myself, I couldn't cook fast <clears throat> enough for them. And, and then we, finally they were yeah. like, my stomach hurts. <laughs> we, we didn't know we should have cut them yes. off. <laughs> yes, because their, their, their stomach probably isn't used to... That uh, much meat that either much meat. at the same yeah. time. But it was, yes, it was very sweet. And but very they, they, I mean, they, it's something they can... Even still, they loved the experience. They loved the experience. And, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, besides the, the experiences that you provide for them, um, you also... I think, provide them English classes, right? Yes, so and we teach them English mm -hmm. and vocabulary words. Mm -hmm. um, public speaking. Pu yes, the public speaking, which mm -hmm. I love. You got to judge that. I got to judge them, and, and they. it's so neat to see them when they first try to um, present. They're so shy, and, and, and they look everywhere but at the judges, right, <laughs> or the audience. And then after two, three times, they right? got better. They got better. Mm -hmm. so. And then two of them did a speech in front of the crowd at my last fundraising event, yes. and they did phenomenal. I thought mm -hmm. that's that's a, the thing is a joy to see them um, blossom yes. in whatever they're learning. Yes. So you also do. I know um, because we participated in it. You also do like Christmas wish list and backpack program. Yes. Or? So every year. Um, so education, to me, is a ticket to freedom in mm -hmm. America, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's free. So, um, and because they are so poor, everything they have is donated. They don't get a saying in what they wear most of the time. No. Because they can't afford to buy it. The parents can barely afford food on the table, so they're not getting a new outfit for mm -hmm. first day of school. There's no back-to-school shopping. And there's no back-to-school shopping. No. Um, so we provide back new backpacks, shoes, and school supplies for them every year. Mm -hmm. Um, and I get a lot of slack for this, but mm -hmm. I do let the children pick the backpacks they would like yes, to have. Yes, you do. So we have to go shop specifically for the backpack that they would mm -hmm. like, because it's the only time they actually get a saying in their life. And I want them to feel proud when they go to school that they actually have something that represents who they are, right? Whether it be Spider-Man or Princess or just their favorite color for this year. It makes them so proud to go to school to wear, to have something that they, it like that's them this year, right? 
and that connects them to their classmates because yes. they have the same things. Mm -hmm. um, I had mm -hmm. the pleasure of shopping with you yes. um, for the backpacks. And this is why in the introduction where I say, you know, you pour your love out for, for the people around you. Because me, I'm just grabbing them. <laughs> okay, you need 25 red ones, we're grabbing 25 <laughs> red, red ones. ones. I don't care if it's Nike or whatever. <laughs> but she just brought out on the um, aisle. Okay, never mind, there's other shoppers, okay? She's sprawled out on the aisle this, her, with all the different backpack, and she's looking at her list. She goes, no, she needs, she needs something more sparkly. This one's for her. And really care about each individual child and what they will like and don't like. So that's, that takes, this is not just check the box. Yes. That you really love them, and then you want them to um, have that one thing or two things that they yes. can feel proud about at school because they're probably going to show up in some hand-me-downs or yes. um, things that doesn't make them connect to their class, their non-Afghan yes. or, or Burmese classmates. So, yeah, I just touched my heart to see that. So, of course, I was more patient <laughs> with that shopping spree. Well, the I thought really, you were really awesome patient. thing is those kids know that we love them. Yes, they do know. Mm. They do know. Yes. I, David is the hugger. Mm -hmm. um, every kid, when they see her, boys and girls, um, he doesn't keep class rules as much, but he's a <laughs> hugger. And they just love love hugging on you. And you're, you're so tall, they just like climb on you like a, a, a jungle, jungle gym. gym. <laughs> I call him the human they jungle gym. They do know. They do they know. They love Mr. David. So, you, you, know, you know, you talked about um, movies for everyone, Korean barbecue, backpacks, and shoes. Um, and every week you go to, to see them every week in and, and clothing, furniture, and all this stuff. Surely, they don't all come out of your garage. <laughs> How do you support and sustain um, this? And, and you do this every day every week. How do you support and sustain this ministry? I will say that I have been amazingly blessed by so many generous donors. Um, I get donations randomly throughout the year. Um, every year for my birthday, I instead of asking for gifts, I always ask for donations. Mm -hmm. At this uh, stage in my life, I don't need any more stuff. <laughs> so donating to my charities the greatest gift you can give me because it allows me to give to these kids and, and I, I want to interject because i do know you personally to the point when your father recently passed away he asked for they asked for donations yes. to your charity because my dad asked that before he passed yeah because he knew that i was helping the refugees mm -hmm. and because we were refugees he yes. knew that that would help yes, yes. and so um, we all felt like flowers will die and it doesn't give back. Mm -hmm. And so they, my mom and my dad had decided before my dad passed that that's what they had wanted. So they didn't want flowers. Mm -hmm. They want things that have enduring value. Because yes. they were refugees too. Yes. Because they were refugees too. Yes. Wow. <laughs> all right. <And> so <laughs> since you're on donations, it's yes. not just money. Right. It's clothes, yes. it's furniture, and everything, I mean, toys, and everything. Everything. Now, that leads me to uh, the question. So, behind the scenes, um, I, I know people are donating, you said random donations, so do stuff to show up at your door. Are they all in good conditions? Or are they ready to be packaged up and give what do you what else do you have to do to them so um it's experience over time right you ask for donation but if you don't say anything you get all kinds of things mm -hmm. you get furniture with holes in them you barely get, holding together yes they rock they rickety <laughs> um you get dirty stained clothes you get half used tube of toothpaste mm -hmm. you get hair brushes filled with hair you get all kinds of things. So now I have to be very specific in asking um, because I, I do want to share with the, with you, like we live in a house and we have washing, we have a washing and uh, drying machine right there. So we just throw everything in the washing machine and then it's all done right there. But for them, 
it is so much hardship for them to have to go to the washing machine to do this. And a lot of times the washing machines in these apartment complexes are filled with mold and mm. mildew. It mm. is filthy. And then for the Afghans, when they have families of eight or 13, the, the washing machines that's provided there doesn't help. So they actually have to put everything up in what, those big black trash bags and take them to a uh, wash it area to wash it in those big commercial size. Mm -hmm. So you see these kids wear the same tops and bottom for days, the same one. Mm -hmm. So the parents don't have to spend so much time washing their clothes, not to mention the cost of soap and all the coins that is required for them to wash. So I've been asking people to please wash the clothes before you make the donation. Yeah. Um, Cause even though I have a washing machine, I don't have the capacity to wash all of the donated clothes before we send them out and either. You get them a lot You'd too. Be a yes. Full time wash person. Yes. <laughs> and on the furniture side of that equation, yes. It, when we get things that are in bad need of repair, we can't hand that to them. They mm -hmm. don't. They don't have tools. Right. They don't have any way or to, don't have of to fixing do it. anything. Yes. I, I have tools and, and mm -hmm. can fix stuff, but that takes time. So, so behind the scenes, I know that you are like handyman, computer fixer, bike, bike fixer. fixer. What else do you fix? Uh, carpet washer. He heavy yes. furniture mover. We, delivery. Yes. And then it's all the rugs that we, we get. We check, make sure that they're clean because I always think that if you're going to donate something, you mm. need to donate it where you yourself would want to use it, right? Yes. That's how I look at it. I don't look at it as they're refugees, just give them whatever. Mm -hmm. um, they're humans just like Yes, us. they are. And so I want to give them things that I would wear, I would use mm -hmm. in my own home, mm -hmm. in a condition that I would be willing to to desire to have in my home. Yes. So Be proud to use. That's, yes. Because yes, they're humans. And yeah. be comfortable with it, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Every rug, we roll them out, we'll mm -hmm. vacuum them. If they're dirty, he'll shampoo them. And then we have to let it lay on our driveway to, dr to get the sun to dry. And hopefully it doesn't rain. And yes. Been there. <laughs> yes, it has oh, rained on us that before. That was an adventure. Um, and then I, I do check out the clothes to make sure that we're not giving them you know, inappropriate clothing. Right, because they're cultural. Yes, they're culturally very conservative, it's, both of them, the Burmese and... The Burmese less so. Yes. But even still, they prefer to be more covered up. Sure. Than, yes. Unfortunately, a lot of Americans. A lot of the current fashion, especially for girls, are yes. very Revealing. Short. <laughs> yes. And so, that's, yeah, that's an absolute no-no in the Afghan community. No, no. And... I don't think that the Burmese cared as much, but as as our kids in that community have gotten older and older now, there's some there's some mm -hmm. teenagers. They are actually choosing to be yes. more modest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. And and with all of that, what do you think are the biggest challenges you face in your ministry work, um, whether it's with the with the Afghans or the um, Burmese? What are the biggest challenges you face? To do the work that you want to do or like to do, we don't, we need more volunteers because mm -hmm. there's just me. So mm -hmm. um, I will say that I have been so grateful for the volunteers that I do get. Like if we have a function, I am never short of volunteers. Mm -hmm. People will show up and help with whatever event I have. Mm -hmm. But to get committed volunteers that is that are willing to go every single week to help mm -hmm. you, that is difficult to get. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we all have lives, yeah. and we have families, and we have jobs. So to co be committed yeah. to give time every single week consistently, yeah. it's difficult to it's get. It's really hard when, you know, when adults have children themselves, and we went through this. But yeah. our kids, they're grown and have their own lives now. So we have the capacity to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we totally understand when people have kids at home, sure. that has to be yes. their focus. Or full-time jobs. Yes, or, yes. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're so um, grateful for you. Well, this is because you, I'm hearing your stories um, previously to this podcast, and 
just felt so moved by what you guys do and what um, and then have visited had the opportunity to go on field trips with them and seeing the kids and just, they they're so appreciative. I mean, everything is all in wonder. And it's 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 a huge blessing to you to get yes. to love on those kids because they just soak it up and they, and they love it me to you. back right away. They 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 write me love notes and stuff. Yes. So so it's that's yeah. what you know keeps. All, all of us going yes, right so is. yes no so yeah um i wanted to just you know you guys we've been focusing on the refugees and just really want to know from your perspective um what are some of your most memorable experiences through 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 all of this because i've i've talked to you lots and i've heard some um stories and and you know just some of them are just like, how do you even? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some memorable experiences, whether it's, it's good or um, challenging, but memorable nevertheless? Oh. Um, Maybe one each? <laughs> <laughs> I will say that, you know, the Burmese have been mild-mannered people. So... Um, I, from my uh, conduct perspective, I don't have a huge issue with them. Mm. So I'll share one memorable moment for me. When I first started at the Burmese, I was still have I still had a job, and my job in the executive role days are very very stress. Some days are very mm. stressful. Um, so at that time, I was buying the shoes personally. Mm. And they have very wide feet, and finding wide shoes is very difficult. So um, I would buy all the shoes. We would all go get them fitted, and then they wouldn't fit. So I'd have to go back and exchange them and bring them back. And then they still don't fit, so I have to go. And so sometimes I'll have to run to the store like five times just to get everybody fitted for a pair of shoes. I'm very grateful for this organization first blessing that brings a ton of shoes out now but before it was just me running back and forth and I remember this is my third run and um, I was very stressed from work that day and I'm, I'm at that time my job was uh, is in California mm -hmm. so they are on Pacific time mm -hmm. so five o'clock here is still only three o'clock there mm -hmm. And it's time for me to go to see the kids. And I have, I, this is my third run for the shoes. And I was so stressed and frustrated just thinking, oh, gosh, this, this ministry is wearing on me because mm -hmm. I have my job and that's my current responsibility to my boss and I have all these problems. Mm -hmm. And so I went. I would say I went that evening very frustrated, probably a little bit of a bad attitude almost, like it's a burden, yeah, right? Um, because of the level of stress I was under. I'll try not to cry. Mm. And I so I show up, <laughs> and I have this one little girl, and it was for her. And she took the shoes that I was bringing for her, and she hugged it, and she was so mm. happy because... She said this is her first pair of shoes mm. ever because this whole time she's been wearing her grandma's shoes and her shoes were so big it would go all the way out to here. Yes. The whole time I saw that and I just thought she's just grabbing whatever shoes. Mm -hmm. Not that she didn't have shoes, but she hugged it so tight. She's like, this is my very first pair of shoes I've ever owned. Mm. And I just thought, ah, my bad attitude went away. And but just, we, yes, it really put things in our yes. perspective. Wow, thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Do we have clean <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when I think about those moments where mm. just what a difference you make in these children's lives. And those little things. You don't, like you say, you don't have to donate big money. Yes. But even... Or any money. Or any money. Even your daughter's hand-me-down shoes yes. is so fashionable and new in their only first pair of shoes. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Little things, little yeah. things. It's so it's so little, and it makes such a difference in these people's lives that mm -hmm. it's a uh, it, it it really touches you, and it makes you realize 
how blessed you are and how much we take for granted every little thing we have here. Every little thing. Yes, it makes me mm. so grateful just for mm -hmm. the lives that we have here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. And David, I want to, I'm not going to try to make you cry either, but <laughs> what are some of your memorable moments? We've been working with the Burmese for eight years. Mm -hmm. um, so, and there, there's a core group of kids from when we started eight years ago that are still here. So they're like our second set of kids. Yeah. And so we've been watching them grow through elementary school and middle school. And some, now some of them are in high school. And it's just, it's been awesome watching them grow mm -hmm. up. Some weeks it's just repetitive stuff, and, but you still get to interact with them. But then you do fun things like the summer water balloon fight, which is just complete chaos. And you just get to see them all having so much fun mm. that you don't get to see in the daily or the yeah. weekly interactions with them. Um, and those are just, those are a huge blessing. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and, and just, you know, this weekend, this past weekend, when you brought the girls, and I was able to tag along um, some of the girls to um, enjoy a meal out, um, and they actually have to use fork and knife, and yes. not straight with her hands, and, and go to an ice cream store, and, and dressed up all pink for Barbie themed, and just seeing them, um, and even during that trip, I've seen some of the girls started out very... Yes. Know, stoic. Yes. Stoic. Yes. Yes. I did too. Right? Yes. And at the end, they hugged, and then they, and you hear that, thank you, Miss Lily. You can hear mm -hmm. that they truly were, were touched by the experience, and, and mm -hmm. then for them to say, thank you, in that, in that little low voice, not the, you know, usual, thank you, you know, Miss Denise, but the, in that, in that mm -hmm. little voice, you just felt like, you know, that they, they were touched. And, yes. Um, anyways, I'm. I'm. I, it's 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 all the moments are memorable because it is so unlike the lives we live. And yes. right. And it's 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 so hard to pick one. It is so hard to pick one. We could be um, here. We have I a would, whole podcast just on the yes memorable experiences. Yeah. I would I would throw in the the Christmas party with with the Burmese as well because. For most of them, it's the only Christmas present they get. It's not just the only Christmas present. It's the only gift they get all year. Yeah. Mm. They don't get birthday presents. No, they get not, They get no gifts. So that is the only gift they get all year. And they get some good gifts, too. They so do, because we have is. the most generous donors. I just can't even begin to express how grateful I am. For yeah, you the, didn't even explain the yes. whole Christmas party process with the Burmese. Yes, yeah, so because they... Because they don't get gifts, they get to do a wish list, and they get to list three items on their wish list, and then we match them up with a volunteer. And we, have, go, we have families adopt these yes. kids for Christmas. And Christmas so they can buy one, two, or all three items that are listed, and then they actually get to bring them to the apartment complex and meet the children and mm -hmm. hand it to the children. And the Burmese are just so reserved, so they don't, they're not as expressive. But, you know, when they go home, they're so happy because it's the only gift they've ever received. Especially the first year, they were besides themselves. They were so excited. And just to see their faces light up when they see it, even though they're reserved, you could just tell, like, and the moms come afterwards, and they're crying. They're like, oh. thank you so much for loving my kids. And mm. I get so many moms come crying after the party is over. Mm. Just to see how much we love their kids mm -hmm. to be able to provide for them something they can, personally can never provide for their children. Yes, and I think that, I think maybe the, um, maybe this is my impression. After the party, when they see, it's not just David and Denise love them. It's all these people. They see that there's actually a whole bunch of people who sponsor mm -hmm. their gifts and whatnot, or volunteers to come out with a to to help yes. with the party that loves on them. That yes. they it, they're not so alone. Yes, mm -hmm. that they're they're not very so alone. touched at how much the community mm -hmm. pour, 
pours into their children. Yeah. And we'll have some of the donors for that party. They'll adopt the same kids year after year after year. So they get to see the children grow grow. up. And then a lot of the donors have started providing uh, food like rice, oil, salt, and Mm -hmm. things like that for the families. Mm. And they... uh, help the children bring these things home Mm -hmm. so they they can can see meet the family and see Mm -hmm. how they live and Mm -hmm. um i have a lot of refugee like people like me that were once refugees and i think it's been a while since we were refugees so we forget how difficult it is and i've had people who are like oh yeah i'm a refugee i'm like okay well thanks for donating this can you deliver it for me so they will deliver it, and they walk into the apartment, and they see how these people they live. have a little flashback, yeah. And they just break down and cry. Even men, grown men, have broken down and cried just watching the circumstances of mm-hmm. their, the condition in which these apartment complex units are like. And so then they start wanting to donate more because they now see how difficult it is mm. and the living condition these people are in, right? Because we, yeah. for, we forget. And we, we haven't really described the, those conditions. We've said they live in apartments, which is a huge step up from yes. where they were. Yes, why did you describe camps. it? But, I mean, it's, you know, it's not like going and renting a, a Western-style <clears throat> apartment. They, they are, but they're really, really old. They're very run down. They often have issues with mold. They always have issues with roaches. And they're mm. they're never clean. The only time they're ever clean is when a family moves into yes. one that they have just renovated. Um, and, and that's these, probably why they become a, a a refugee complex, right? Because they get govern governments get, yep. pay for assistance. It. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, they they may not even get. No, they wouldn't. Clients. They wouldn't qualify because yeah. they don't have jobs <clears throat> most of the time, right? Mm-hmm. So um, that's why they have to move into government-assisted. Um, and then these complex. apartments don't don't upkeep as well because they don't. They get mm-hmm. government assistance funding. They, yes, and they also know that these people don't speak English, so mm. they can't say anything. Mm. It's another difficult. Remember, they're human. Yes, it's another mm. difficulty I face because mm. I I see how poorly they're treated, but I can't say anything. Because mm. if I say something, they'll get kicked out of the complex. Yeah, we don't want that to No, happen. I don't want them homeless, so I can't even complain on their behalf because it's... But, it, I mean, the kitchen counters are caving in like this because there's a plumbing leak and they won't come replace it. Mm. I see wall ceilings breaking through because of roof leaks. They won't come fix it. They just keep letting them live like that. Mm. It's not good. What gave y'all this capacity to love like this? <laughs> you when you saw for yourself what it's like when you show up to see this, right? Mm-hmm. It's just it it really tugs on your heart. And my for me personally, my deep compassion to see these kids thrive in this community. I want to see them get out of poverty, get their families out of poverty, and live a productive life in America. Mm-hmm. And um, and know what it's like not to live on welfare. Mm-hmm. And to enjoy the things that are out there. Mm-hmm. Um, There's so many things they don't know. This, uh, last summer, we also took some kids to a church beach retreat. It was the first time they'd ever walk on sand. sand. And then when we took them downtown to eat at the Korean barbecue, it was the first time they'd ever seen those b- big buildings downtown. They'd never seen. They were like, oh, wow. The high-rise buildings. The high-rise uh-huh. buildings. Actually, like, and they were excited to see the bathroom hand dryer. Oh, yes, most of them. <laughs> they think it's magic water when it's the hand sensor water. Yes. They think it's magic water. Yes, and then the hand dryer goes off. They were, like, ecstatic and, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's all new. new yes, world. it's all new, mm. and but they don't know what they're missing until you show it to them, and that's what gives them the aspiration to so work when harder. You, when you give love and you see see the awe and wonder that they have, and see that they can potentially aspire yes for more, and then you you get that as a motivation to keep going. Is that 
it, it, it I, propels you like that? It does. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess my biggest thing is just I really would like to break the poverty cycle mm -hmm. in these families. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, it broke my heart to see the oldest son graduating from high school and just read just doing whatever his parents is doing. No, not yeah, better. There's no, no. There's no improvement. There's mm -hmm. just. But they don't. Point. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. At the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we talk about a, a lot about that mm -hmm. going to college versus not going to college, mm -hmm. making ten dollars an hour versus thirty dollars an hour. Who would want to make ten dollars working one hour versus working one hour and getting thirty, $30. forty, fifty dollars mm -hmm. an hour? Mm -hmm. Like, it's just such a di huge difference in mm -hmm. your lifestyle and what you can do with mm -hmm. your life mm -hmm. by having that. It, even if they don't go to college, I told them just to get that additional education after high trade school, school. Trade school, school. Or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in their mind, they now know you have to go to college. Mm -hmm. And so we took a few to Baylor where our kids went to school mm -hmm. just for them to see what college looks like mm -hmm. because... They understood the word college, but they didn't understand what that it's meant. It's just a word. Until it's just they a saw. word. It was, wow. It's yes. a big, big school. Yes. It's so pretty. <laughs> wow. So um, have you had kids that have moved on to out of high school yet? Have you been with no, the community line I'm, enough to see The anyone? oldest kid I have is going in the 10th grade, and sadly, she just moved to Minnesota. Oh. Yes. Well, hopefully you still can connect to see. Yes, her sister is still here, so okay. yes. And okay. I'm, I'm friends with her on Facebook, so she mm -hmm. still messages me when she needs something. So, oh. How about you, David? What what um, what gives, what gives motivates you to to are, just... Are you kidding? The, the love I get from these kids mm -hmm. is more than enough. It fuels. Uh -huh. It fuels. They do. Be, you can you can yes. go, and sometimes you're just exhausted when you're when you're doing this, and mm -hmm. then those kids start loving on you, and you just mm -hmm. it melts away. You should see. You should see. You should see when <laughs> when they pull up. Um, there's already a little entourage. They they are waiting for your car. They know your car, and they're waiting, and they they just run. They just run for hugs, and then when they're ready to leave. And there's an entourage running behind the cars. Yes. And sometimes there's even maybe stowaways. Uh, they just want to go home with you. Yes. Um, and, and that does that does give you a lot of um, it does. affirmation yes. that what you're doing, they're receiving. Yes. Yeah. So in, w w as we wrap up this, this there, we could go for like six yes. part, part six <laughs> to this. Um, what do you want our audience, whether they're watching us or they're listening to the podcast, What's one or two key points that you really want them to, if they didn't hear anything else, that you really want them to hear from your stories? For me, I just want the, the public to be aware that we do have refugees that are here and their life circumstances are not what they asked. Um, it's not something they did to themselves. It's just a... A situation that was put upon them because of where they mm -hmm. originally lived or um, where they're from um, just the persecution that they were there and that they are here legally um, and they do need mm -hmm. help um, in order for America to do well we have to help these refugees assimilate because they whether you help them or ignore them they are there and they these children are the future of america and so together we can help them assimilate to make america better when they're so young it's better for us to teach them the proper etiquette the proper ways to behave in america how to navigate this country and how to navigate and how to be a productive citizen mm -hmm. in this country or to keep living off of mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. taxpayers, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think anybody wants these refugees to live off of our tax tax dollars. Mm -hmm. So just a little bit of volunteer time, a little donation can go, can go such a long way to making a difference to these refugees' lives. Mm -hmm. Yes. How about you, David? Um, what I would say uh, is... 
anybody that actually wants to give back to their community, but they're afraid to, there is nothing to be afraid of. These, whether it's the Burmese or the Afghans, who are all, they're all Muslim. There's nothing to be afraid of. These people will all love you and well, they welcome every single volunteer who's ever come yes. with us. And I, I'll be, I will testify to that. Um, I guess it's been about a year since I kind of got kind of dipped my toes into um, into helping your organization, volunteering with the organization, and I knew nothing. Um, I really didn't know the the Muslim culture. I really didn't know anything about refugees, and uh, I was you probably could tell my sense of uh, um, nervousness. Nervousness, yes. and it's like, what do I do? What do I do? Um, but yes, they immediately, they seem to like, know. okay, you're here to help me and uh, I'm going to let you <laughs> and I'll let you and then I will love you for it. Yes. And, um, it, it, that's what it keeps us going back. And, but I will say, um, really you guys have inspired my husband and I to go back week after week as well, because, um, a, we, you, you model it for us. You, we can see that what you do really do impact them. And that they love you back. So then we are not afraid to try. Yes. Right? So, and, and I think it's important to, for this podcast and for you all to hear the stories mm -hmm. because it's not scary. Um, they're nice people and they really, truly need the help in every little bit, um, even just spending time because they are lonely. Yes. They left mm -hmm. everything that they have. They're lonely. And, and um, the community they have are all... Um, refugee community and sometimes they yeah. just need people who don't also have problems um, to talk to and the, yes. the more americans they get to interact with yes the easier it is for them to assimilate you know, assimilate. assimilate yes so we go and we say hello how are you and we don't you know and and, and ask them to say it back um just all part of uh welcoming them to mm -hmm. our community and and be part and partaking part of our community yes. Well, thank you guys so much for joining our podcast and yeah, sharing so openly and, and vulnerably. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we hope that um, everyone who's been watching, maybe you can find a way um, that you can participate uh, in helping, whether it's the refugees or any other needs. Uh, again, there's probably more stuff in your house that you need. So maybe look around your house. Maybe there's something that um, you don't need anymore, but it'd be a treasure for them. So... Thank you for coming, and we'll see y'all next time. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thanks Thank for you. having us. And that brings us to the end of another exciting episode of Hello World. Please support our podcast by hitting the subscribe button. Also, don't forget to smash that like. Your likes will help our podcast reach more awesome people like you. Lastly, tap that notification bell to receive instant alert whenever we drop in a new episode. We can't wait to see you again on our next episode. Until then, keep on being a positive force in this world.